Hello there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. My name is Brian Wells. I'm coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the Homestead Journey. This is episode number five. Thank you so much for joining us on the Homestead Journey. I hope this finds you well. We are doing a lot better getting over some sickness here that had kind of settled in, but uh, feeling a lot better. And looking forward this week to the American Thanksgiving holiday, we are going to be enjoying our first homegrown turkey. And I am very excited about that. So on next week's episode, I will be giving you a full report. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, it's as good as I have it um, in my mind, and uh, looking forward to it. It should be a good time and very satisfying to have raised the food that we're going to eat and enjoy on our Thanksgiving holiday. So let's jump right into this episode's homestead happenings. On our homestead this week, it was actually a very, very busy week. This time of year, I usually expect things to kind of slow down and, with the shorter days and, and so forth. And it really wasn't that way. This week, we did a lot of quote unquote homesteading stuff. We started out the week actually uh, doing up 30 pounds of carrots that I had purchased from a local farm. They were selling at a really great price, uh, 30 pound bags of what they called seconds or juicing carrots. And these were carrots that were maybe a little misshapen or a little cracked, maybe a little bit too big. Um, and so we processed those up. I thought my canning season was over, had my canners put away, had to go pull them out of storage. And uh, we did up 37 pints of carrots and also froze some. And so we will be enjoying those all winter long. The second big thing that we did here on the homestead this week is rendered lard. I used up all of the lard that we had upstairs and so I went down to the freezer and lo and behold I got out the last jar of rendered lard and so it was kind of perfect timing because we have some pigs that are going to the butcher in a couple of weeks and I needed to clear out the fat from last year that I hadn't rendered yet and so I got I think it was I had about 26 pounds or a little over 20 pounds of fat uh, that I pulled out of the freezer and I rendered that down and from that I got 10 quarts of lard and on today's homestead hack segment I'm going to be sharing with you a really really easy way to render lard this week I was also able to get some more work done on the Ruth stout garden bed that I'm preparing for next spring now, for those of you who might not know, the Ruth Stout Garden Method is a deep mulch method that uses hay as the mulch. And so I was able to get some hay from a friend of mine and get that spread out over quite a bit of the garden bed that I'm preparing. Didn't have enough hay to get all of it done, so I'll get some more hay from him tomorrow. I'm really excited about this experiment. I really enjoy experimenting with different types or styles of gardening. A couple of years ago, I did some experiments with straw bale gardening, some uh, grow bags for potatoes, and just, I really enjoy that. And so we will see how this pans out. I'm excited about sharing this journey with you and just letting you know whether or not Ruth Stout Gardening works for me. And this week, I was also able to get another project done that I have been wanting to do for a very, very long time, and that's build some shelving units uh, to store our supplies on and so forth. We did a clean out. I think I shared that with you a couple of episodes ago where we brought in a dumpster and cleaned out some of that stuff that we've accumulated over the years. But uh, now we have the stuff that we decided that we were going to keep. What are we going to do with it? And so I was able to get that project done. It's something that I've been wanting to do for a very, very long time. And again, these short days kind of chased me inside. It was nice this past week because I didn't have a lot of stuff going on in the evenings. A lot of times I'll have meeting after meeting after meeting. Almost every night I've got something going on. And this last week, I only had one evening where I had anything going on. 
So I really had a lot of time to get stuff done. And it just was a very busy, but a very satisfying week here on the homestead. Let's jump on over to this episode's community corner. Now this week, as I was preparing the Ruth Stout garden beds, I took some pictures and I posted them on some of the Facebook homesteading groups that I'm a member of. And once again, I was reminded of how discouraging uh, the quote unquote online homesteading community can be. <laughs> I have fairly thick skin and it didn't really bother me. In fact, I found it rather humorous, but I thought I would share with you some of the feedback that I got and then try to help you deal with the haters. <laughs> because you're going to get them. You're going to get people who tell you what you're doing is wrong, th that they know better, um, that you're an idiot. Uh, you know, you, you'll get the whole gamut. And you're going to get people that, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's keyboard warrior-itis or, or whatever, um, but are going to, and, and maybe they're well-meaning, I don't know, but they're going to try to discourage you from following your homestead journey. So I posted these pictures of the hay that I had spread out over this garden bed and I got responses like, well, I hope you like weeds. Uh, you know, why in the world are you using hay? Uh, you know, that you just reseeded your lawn. And that may be the case. I don't know. They may be 100% right. Uh, I, I got replies like, well, you're, you should be using wood chips. Well, wood chips isn't the Ruth Stout garden method. The Ruth Stout garden method is hay. She used hay. She recommended hay. She loved hay. And so I, I want to do the Ruth Stout garden method, not the Back to Eden garden method. And there's a reason why I'm doing the Ruth Stout versus the Back to Eden garden method. I cannot get, or I haven't been able to find in my area, a reliable supply of wood chips. There's hay everywhere. I'm surrounded by dairy farms and horse farms. There's hay everywhere. So it makes sense for me to try the Ruth Stout Garden method. I also was told I should use straw. I had one individual, probably well-meaning, but give me a very condescending definition of the difference between straw and hay, as if I didn't know that. <laughs> it was rather comical. Um, but it, no, I got some very positive feedback and people who are saying, uh, you know, that it works well for them and so on and so forth. But I got a lot of negative feedback and very condescending uh, feedback. So how do you deal with that? Well, first of all, I think that you need to understand your journey. Why are you doing what you're doing? In my case, this is an experiment. I am experimenting with the Ruth Stout Garden Method. And so I want to do the Ruth Stout Garden Method like Ruth Stout. My journey is to experiment with that garden method. Now, I had thought about experimenting with the Back to Eden garden method, but because I can't get wood chips, I'm going with, I shouldn't say I can't get them, but I'm not confident that I have a reliable supply, then I'm going to go the Ruth Stout route. So, I know my journey. I understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. Having said that, I also do think that you need to be willing to learn and adjust course as necessary. Now, quite frankly, this is tough, especially with online community, because you never know if Joe Blow from Idaho really knows what he's talking about or not. That's why I think it is very important to develop and foster relationships with mentors, whether it's mentors with regards to raising chickens or raising pigs or gardening or canning or what have you but find some people, and preferably, if you can, find people in real life, so to speak, people that you know, people that you trust, so that when they talk to you, you can learn from them and you can adjust course as necessary. Finally, I think it's important to remember that there aren't too many cases where there's only one right way to do something. What you're doing may end up being a spectacular failure. This Ruth Stout Garden experiment may be the most weed-infested garden of all time. I don't know. But if it is, then like Thomas Edison, I'll say, well, that's one more of the 10,000 ways that I know how not to make a light bulb. 
<laughs> one more of the 10,000 ways that I know how not to raise food. All right, folks, that's the end of this week's Community Corner. Let's jump on over to Charting the Course. On this episode's Charting the Course, we are actually going to start a series on gardening. Now, you may be sitting there saying, Brian, why in the world start a series on gardening at this time of the year? This is a crazy time to start a series on gardening. And you know what? You might be right. But there is a method to my madness. The first reason why I'm starting this series now is because there are certain things that you can do and probably should do now to prepare yourself for success in the spring when you plant your garden. If you are using methods like a traditional tilling of the garden and you're preparing a new spot, if the frost hasn't already set into the ground, then you're gonna to wanna to break ground now so that it can rot down during the winter months. If like me, you're going to be using some kind of a deep mulch system like Ruth Stout or like a lasagna or like a uh, back to Eden style garden, then you're gonna to wanna to prepare that now so that it's composting and rotting down over the winter and then you're gonna be well positioned to plant in the spring. But the second reason why I'm starting this series on gardening is we're going to touch on things like food preservation and some of the tools that you might need for the garden. And my thought process was that the holidays are coming up. And so you may want to put some of these things on your holiday wish list. Or if you're preparing a budget for your family or your homestead for next year, you may want to budget for things like maybe a canner or a dehydrator or a vacuum sealer or maybe a tiller or a broad fork or whatever that you need to successfully raise and grow food within your gardening methodology. On this episode, the first in our gardening series, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the different gardening methods and also try to help you answer the question, what method should I use? Before we get into discussing the various gardening methods, I do want to start by saying that I don't believe that there's any one right way to raise a garden. Now, there are certain people who are well-meaning but and, and, and very passionate about certain styles of gardening, and they're going to lead you to believe that if you're not gardening the way that they garden, then you're doing it wrong. That's simply not true. If you are successfully raising and growing your own food, that's awesome. Now that's not to say that we can't do better and that we can't learn and we can't adapt and that we can't uh, raise even more food, but folks, there is no one right way to garden. Each situation is going to be unique. And so what works for one person may not necessarily work for another. For example, going back to my experiment with a deep mulch system, I'm not using the Back to Eden system because of a, I don't have confidence that I am going to have a steady supply of wood chips. And so the Back to Eden gardening method may be the best thing since sliced bread, but if I can't get wood chips, then it's not going to work for me. So does that mean that all of a sudden I can't raise and grow my own food? No. That's hooey. So again, there is no one right way to do this. So what are some of these styles or methods of gardening? Well, there's a really great site called morningchores.com, and I'm gonna link to this site in the show notes that has a really great list. It's about 18 different gardening methods, and it's actually not a comprehensive list because there's a couple of gardening methods that aren't even on there that we're gonna talk about. But what I really liked about this site is that it has a nice, concise description of that style of gardening, and it also gives some scenarios in which it might make sense to use that style of gardening. So everything from container gardening to traditional in-ground gardening to uh, raised bed gardening, uh, vertical gardening, and the list goes on and on. Um, aquaponics, hydroponics, square foot gardening, um, container gardening, 
uh, in hanging baskets, edible landscapes, window boxes, greenhouse cold frames and high tunnels, keyhole gardening, lasagna ga gardening, straw bale gardening, core gardening, no-till gardening, hugel culture, which I never know how to say that, but that's a mound uh, built over uh, rotting wood. Um, and then there's a couple of other styles on here that maybe you might go under the uh, no-till or lasagna gardening, but that would be the Back to Eden and Ruth Stout gardening methods, which are a deep mulch style gardening. All of those are, in my opinion, great gardening methods that can work for a, a variety of different people in a variety of different ways. And I don't think there's any one of them that is any better or any worse than any others, depending on your particular situation. So for example, if we were to say that no-till was the way to go, and there are many people right now in the homesteading community that are enamored with no-till gardening, and I think that there's a lot of reason why it makes sense, but I certainly don't think it's the only way to garden. And But people are enamored with it. And so if I were to say that no-till is the only way to go, well, if you live in an urban area, and you have no land to no till, then I have just left you with nothing. Well, that's not a good option. Where, if, What about container gardening? What about vertical gardening? Those are ways where, yeah, maybe you're not growing squash, maybe you're not growing corn in a vertical garden, but at least you can grow some lettuce, some greens, some herbs, uh, maybe some tomatoes. I don't know what else you could grow in a vertical garden. But if I were to tell you that no-till was the only way, then now all of a sudden you've got no way. That makes no sense. And again, going back to back to Eden, if I were to say that's the only way and you can't get wood chips, what then? So then with these 18 or 20 garden methodologies that I've listed and that site lists, how do you choose which one is going to be best for you? Well, the first thing I would say is you don't have to choose just one. I mean, experiment with a variety of them. If you're just starting out, you're not really quite sure what you want to try, maybe try some container gardening, maybe try some raised beds and a small in-ground, quote-unquote, traditional garden plot. Try and see which one you like best, which one yields better results in your area. What are your constraints? If you're in an HOA and you can't do a traditional in-ground garden, Maybe an edible landscape approach where you mix in edible uh, plants within your landscaping, maybe that's the best option for you. Or maybe you're going to need to do some vertical gardening. If you're in an urban area, again, container gardening might work for you. Or maybe you can work with some landowners to take their front lawn and turn it into a mini food forest or an edible landscape. What resources are available to you? That may dictate what style of gardening you use. For example, again, going back to the Ruth Stout versus the Back to Eden uh, method. If you might not have wood chips, but you have hay. You might not hay, have hay, but you have straw. You might not have straw, but you have access to a bunch of cardboard and compost. What resources do you have available? Do you have a tiller. If you don't have a tiller, can you rent a tiller? If you can't rent a tiller, can you borrow a tiller? Uh, if you're going to do no-till, do you have a broad fork or do you need to buy a broad fork? Find out what other people in your area are doing and what successes and failures are they seeing? Have they tried straw bale gardening and was it successful for them? Do they do more traditional in-ground uh, gardening and find success with that? But find out what other people in your area are doing and having success doing. An important thing, though, to remember is that if you are a first-time gardener, you need to understand the lay of your land. You need to understand how your land works. And if you've just moved on to a piece of property, and it's going to be really tempting to just jump in and you want to put a garden plot here and a garden plot there or this here or that there, you need to understand how your land works. And so if you've got an area that you look at and you say, well, I'd really want a garden spot there, but that land is a really, or that section of land is a really wet spot and it doesn't dry out until July, then that's probably not, not going to be a good place to put a garden bed. 
raised or otherwise, it's going to be saturated all the time. So you may need to look for a different place uh, to put your garden. Or you may look at a place and say, well, I really want to put uh, a garden right there. And then you find out that you've got the way the wind blows or the way the sun shines, and it's not going to be a good fit for a garden. So you want to land, observe and understand your land. But that doesn't mean that you can't garden. So maybe what you do the first year is you put up a couple of raised beds because you can tear them down. You can move the dirt wherever you want it. If you decide, oh man, that's a wrong place, I can move it, no big deal. A little bit of labor, absolutely. You don't want to go into it and put in 20 raised beds and find out that you got to move them to the other side of your lawn. But again, you could do it. You could do some container gardening, but you want to understand and observe your land. But the biggest thing is start now. Now, what do I mean by that? It's real easy to just kind of kick the can down the road and say, okay, I'm going to start in the spring. But if you're going to do lasagna style gardening, or if you're going to do back to Eden style gardening, or if you're going to do um, even straw bale gardening, if you're going to do uh, any kind of a deep mulch method, or you're going to do traditional in-ground gardening, the best time to start is actually in the fall. You're going to want to prepare your bed now. And, and in some places, quite frankly, it may be too late. If you want to do traditional in-ground gardening, it's going to be difficult probably to till that up if the frost is already set in. But if you're going to do like a lasagna style gardening, if you're going to do a Back to Eden or a Ruth Stout, you can put the compost down. You can put down your mulch and it's going to rot down. Even if there's a little snow there, it's still okay. Now you don't want deep, deep snow, but if there's a little bit of snow and you put that stuff down there, all that's going to do is mix in there. It's going to compost down. It's going to be fine. But if you prepare now, it's going to set you up for success in the spring. If you wait to the spring, it's not to say that you can't start, that you can't do those kinds of things, but you're not going to see as much success and as much production from that piece of ground as you would if you were to start now. Now again, I don't know what is going to be the answer for you. I can't tell you that you need to container garden or back to Eden garden or you need to do raised beds or you need to do X, Y, or Z. I don't know what's going to work for you. I know what's worked for me. We started out doing traditional gardening at my grandfather's house. My grandfather did traditional in-ground till every spring gardening for the 40 years that he owned that property. And he raised lots and lots of vegetables, canned and, and preserved lots and lots of produce off of that land. My family has a long history. My aunts and uncles, my mom and dad, when we were younger, did that style of gardening. And they were very successful at it. Now, when we moved up to this property, we do raised beds. And the reason is that because there's a lot of rock and shale where we're at. In fact, this area used to be a huge limestone quarry. And I'm convinced that they dumped all the junk rock on this piece of property. So a traditional style garden wouldn't be wise unless I wanted to repair a lot of equipment. I don't want to repair a lot of equipment. So I built raised beds and we have used predominantly the square foot gardening method in our raised beds. And it's worked out very, very well. A couple of years ago, I experimented with straw bale gardening. That didn't work so well for us. In part, it's because it requires a lot of water. We're on a well and I didn't want to run my water, uh, my well dry. I also uh, did some experiments with some grow bags and potatoes. Didn't have a lot of success with that. I know a lot of people that have. I didn't. This coming year, we're going to experiment with the Ruth Stout Guard method and see how that works out for us. I may have great success. It may be a big failure and a big flop. I don't know. We're going to find out. I'm going to share that journey with you. But those are some of the things that we've done. Now, the reason, again, that I have chosen to use the Ruth Stout method is in part resource driven. I have access to hay. I am not convinced that I will have a perpetual access to wood chips. So that's what I'm going to try. My mom and dad used raised beds now. And the reason is because the land where they're at is very, very heavy clay. 
And what they use in their raised beds is composted horse manure because they live right next door to a horse farm and they have access to all of the free horse manure that they want. They've had great success with that. The amount of food that they preserve every year is astounding. If you were to see a picture of their pantry, you would be amazed. So to sum it up, how do you choose a garden method? First of all, understand your constraints. Secondly, Understand what resources are available. Third, what are others in your area doing? Fourth, know your land. Fifth, start now. And finally, you don't have to choose just one. Try many of them. Remember, there's no one right way to garden. All right, that's it for this episode's Charting the Course. On the next episode, we will continue our gardening series by talking about food preservation, which I know really seems like an odd next step in the gardening series, but I think it will make sense once you hear it. All right, let's jump on over to this week's homestead hack. And this week's homestead hack, as promised, has to do with rendering lard. Now, my understanding is that this also will work for rendering beef fat into tallow, but I have not done that yet, so I cannot speak to that, but my understanding is this method will work for that as well. But before we talk about the method that we use to render lard, I wanted to just really quickly talk about the three types of fat that you can get from a pig. The three types of fat are leaf fat, which is the fat that comes from around the kidneys. There's back fat or fat back, depending on where you're located. And as its name implies, that's the fat that's located generally on the back of the pig between the skin and the meat. And the third type of fat is what's called call fat, which is the fat that's around some of the other organs, uh, the stomach and so forth. Leaf fat is rendered down into leaf lard, and it is the most mild tasting and smelling. In fact, it has virtually no smell and no taste, and is great for baking. Back fat, or fat back, is generally a little stronger in flavor and smell. Uh, depending on how it's rendered, it can be used for baking, but is really better for soap and for cooking purposes. Call fat is used for casings around sausages and pâtés and other meat dishes. It's got a much stronger taste to it. So if you send your pig away to be processed, at least our butcher actually does mix up the leaf fat and the back fat. So if you're not quite sure the difference between the two, um, you can still render it all together. It's not that big of a deal. But if you can get them to separate the two, it doesn't make it that much easier to render the leaf fat down so that you have that separated out for baking purposes. But the process that I'm going to share with you does lend itself to where the initial fat that you bring off of the fat that you're rendering down can also be used for baking purposes as well. So how do we render fat or render fat into lard? Start with a crock pot or a roasting pan. That's really the secret. A lot of people, when they think of rendering fat or rendering tallow, uh, they think of big cauldrons over an open fire that you have to stir continuously for hours. But folks, in this modern age of technological advancements, we have a great tool <laughs> called a crock pot or a roasting pan. Now, I did it in a crock pot last year. This year, I went out and bought a roasting pan so I could do a lot more at one time. Now, there's a couple of schools of thought on the best way to uh, do the next step. You can take the fat and just leave it in one big chunk, throw it in there, render it down that way. You can chunk it up into like one inch cubes and render it down that way or you can grind it up. And you have people who swear by all three methodologies. I have only done the cube it up into about one inch cubes approach. 
I don't have a grinder, so I have not ground it. I think the next time that I go to render the fat into lard, I am going to try leaving the big chunks of fat whole, but we'll see how that all goes. If you do opt to grind it or to cut it up into cubes, a big tip here is to have it partially frozen. Now, not frozen frozen, but you want it so that it's stiff because if it's all the way thawed, then it's going to want to stick to the knife. It's going to want to stick to the grinder blades. It's going to make a bit more of a mess. But if it's still a little bit frozen, it's going to slice up or grind up a little bit easier. Put that all in the crock pot once you've decided how you're going to approach it, whether you're going to grind it, chunk it, or leave it whole. Put it in the crock pot of the roasting pan and just put a little bit of water in it. The water will keep it from scorching as it comes up to temp. Now you're going to want to go low and slow. So put it on low and let it go and just stir it periodically. Again, that's just to keep it from scorching and sticking. Now if you have the leaf fat separated from the back fat, you're going to render that down and that is going to be stuff that's great for baking. As it renders down, scoop it off, put it into a mason jar, keep scooping it off as it renders down, and that is going to be great for baking. But if it's all mixed up, or if you have just straight up back fat, as that renders down, the initial lard that you skim off is going to be very neutral in smell and taste. And so you should be able to bake with that as well. The longer it goes, the more porkier it's going to smell and taste. And so as you go along, it may be more suitable for soap and for cooking. And then towards the end, it's going to be really great for frying potatoes and frying chicken and those kinds of things um, because it's going to have a little bit more of that pork flavor. Put it into mason jars and let it cool. Put a top on it, put a screw top on it, put it in the freezer. And then as you need it, go get it, let it come to room temperature. You can keep it in your kitchen on the counter, you can put it in the fridge. Um, put it in the fridge will help keep it from going rancid, although we've kept some on the counter and had no issue with it. When you're all done, you're going to have leftover little crispy pieces of fat. These are what are called cracklings. And you can save those, put them in the freezer, and use them to flavor cornbread, scrambled eggs, gravies, sauces, things like that. So this is a super easy way to render fat into lard or tallow. And it's something that anybody can do. So you don't need to be afraid of it. You don't need to think of those olden days when it was a big huge pot over a wooden fire that you had to stir constantly. You can set this on, go to bed, let it render overnight, uh, or do it during the day and periodically skim all of that good lard off of it. And again, as you go, as it progresses, it's going to become porkier and porkier in flavor, which just means that you're not going to be able to bake with it, but you'll be able to cook with it, fry with it, makes the best fried chicken. Uh, the lard makes awesome pies. My son used some of our lard from our American guinea hogs to bake a pie for the fair, and the judge was blown away by the crust. She kept asking him over and over again what a secret ingredient was because it was so, so flaky and it was just awesome. And so he won a blue ribbon, and he also earned an invitation to send a pie to our state fair, which he did, and he also won a special award for it. Um, and it was just because of that secret ingredient of lard from our pig. So hopefully you found this homestead hack helpful and hopefully you have enjoyed this fifth episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. If you've enjoyed what you've heard or even if you haven't enjoyed what you've heard, I'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at the Homestead Journey podcast at gmail.com or pop on over to our Facebook page facebook.com slash the homestead journey podcast. And if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave us a review on your favorite podcasting platform and also share it with other people that you think might enjoy what we're doing and might be encouraged on their homestead journey. Until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.